All right, so uh, we're here to talk about Spring Cloud Java, I'm uh, sorry, Cloud Native Java with Spring Cloud Services. Uh, I'm Craig Walls, uh, a little bit about me. I'm, um, work, I'm project lead for Spring Social, but I've also uh, been more recently working a lot on uh, the Spring Cloud Services team. Um, I also, I believe, was wearing this shirt at Spring One last year when I presented. And just for you guys, if you come to my talk tomorrow, I'll wear it again, just, just for you, okay? Um, I'm gonna hand it off now, uh, uh, Scott Frederick. He's a uh, uh, colleague on the same team doing some of the same stuff we're gonna talk about today, so Scott? Yep, and I've been working on Cloud Foundry for about three years and been a user of Spring for a long time and now on the Spring engineering team for about a year, so sort of in between Cloud Foundry and Spring. Um, so this is day two and we're getting towards the end of day two in this conference, so we hope most of you have heard something about Cloud Native Architecture, Spring Cloud, Netflix OSS, and Cloud Foundry. Um, a few things, yeah. Yeah, a few things. How many of you have gone to either uh, Dave and Josh's Spring Cloud intro talk or John and Taylor's uh, Spring Cloud at Netflix talks? Most of you good. All right, better question. How many of you haven't? Oh, so we can make up stuff and you guys yeah. would not know. Okay, great. Go ahead. Because we're sort of basing this talk on top of some of the stuff that you may have heard from them already. Uh, so we're not going to review a lot of what Spring Cloud is in the intro to Spring Cloud. We hope you've heard some about that already. What we're going to talk about is some value that we've been adding on top of Spring Cloud. So we've been building this little product called Spring Cloud Services. Um, and it is Spring Cloud, uh, but it's sort of a curated, opinionated uh, implementation of Spring Cloud developed for Cloud Foundry. Um, so the idea is you don't have to go to open source and get all the Spring Cloud open source bits um, and then stand all that up yourself. Um, we can help you with that. Um, and there's sort of three main goals we had with building this product. They were ease of use, security, and reliability. And we're going to go into some detail about what we mean by each of those. Uh, but what we've implemented is uh, three pieces of Spring Cloud, config server, service registry, and circuit breaker dashboard. And again, we're gonna go into a lot of detail about what those three things are. So um, this isn't gonna be a product pitch. We're not trying to tell you everything about um, how great this product is, um, although we think it is pretty great. We're it's really get, cool. Yeah, it is really cool. <laughs> we're gonna get into the details of how you use it, what the code looks like to consume it. We're gonna get down and talk about Java code and, and Spring stuff and things like that as we go through this talk. Um, so let's start right. off with ease of use. All right. So. For those of you who've seen the talks already on Spring Cloud, or maybe you've used Spring Cloud, you know that there's a couple of things you have to do in order to use Spring Cloud. I mean, certainly you have to write your services that are going to bind themselves to the service registry, uh, or, or register themselves with the service registry, or discover other services from the service registry. You know you're going to have to uh, do things like... Um, you know, get your properties from a, con a centralized configuration server. You know that you're going to annotate some of the methods in your services as circuit breakers so that they'll fail over, so that they'll uh, report metrics, and then you can go to the Histrix dashboard or the circuit breaker dashboard later on and see the details of what's going on there. But you also have to do something else. You also have to go stand up these services, these, these individual servers yourself. You have to go create a, uh, a project, basically to create your own micro, little microservice app that does little more than something along the lines of enable config server or enable Histrix dashboard or enable, um, uh, was it discovery server, Eureka, yeah. Eureka server, whichever one that is. Uh, you have to do those at, those at enables. You gotta remember the annotations too. Yeah, you gotta remember the annotations. The, the reason I'm tr struggling with is they changed them at one time and my brain is still stuck on the old version. Um, but you have to remember to stand those up and deploy those as well as your application. So essentially, you're not only writing the, the, the services that make up your application, you're also writing these other things, basically infrastructural pieces, the, the, the service registry and the dashboard and all these things that if, if I'm doing it and Scott's working on a project and he has to do it and you guys are doing the same thing, you're gonna, we're all gonna have to do the same thing and the big question is why, why, if everybody has to do that, why does everybody have to do it? Why can't, this just happen on its own. And so if you're working with um, uh, Spring Cloud Services, that is exactly what can happen. Instead of standing those things up yourself, you can use Cloud Foundry, you can use the CF command line, or as I'm, you can also use the, as I'm gonna show later, you can use the, uh, the dashboard, and you can, log, you can go in there and you can create a service, create a 
service registry service, create a circuit breaker dashboard service, create a config server service, and then bind those services to the individual uh, microservices that are part of your application. Again, much like you know, what Spring Boot does for you, much like what Spring Cloud itself also does for you in many ways, Spring Cloud Services also just takes it a step further back and enables you to focus on, the, what, on building the services for your app and not really worried on standing up all this infrastructure that's gonna make them work. Um, but when it comes time to actually creating the, uh, the client application, you essentially just do what you would have normally done. You create those client applications. You create a Spring Boot app. You have the Spring Cloud starters. You, you would have to decide whether or not you're going to use Eureka first configure or, or config first bootstrapping. Uh, but when you're, when you're using Spring Cloud services, instead, you basically create the Spring Boot app. You add the starters, and then you bind your service to those individual microservices. You bind the Eureka service or the service registry service to the services in your app. And now those or the config server, and now your, your microservices can consume those other services just as any other service, just like they might consume a Postgres database or a, or a Redis uh, database or, or uh, AMQP or something like that, some other service, they can consume Eureka, they can consume the config server, they can consume the Hystrix dashboard in the same way. So one of the things that, in addition to saving you the trouble of having to stand these services up yourself, is we also save you the trouble of having to secure them. Because I'm not talking about your, your, your microservice, I'm talking about, again, these infrastructural services. If you want to stand up a Eureka server, that's great, you can do that. And now you have to worry about who else is going to consume those services in there. Who's going to come in there looking for your service and then be able to consume it? Who else is going to be able to come in and look at your config server and ask it for the configuration and now they can consume it? If, it's, if you've stood this up and you've put this out on Cloud Foundry, What's stopping someone else from hitting that same service and asking it for the, the configuration of the services that it offers? And so that's where uh, Spring Cloud Services has gone to the trouble of, of securing these for you, and it does it with OAuth. Essentially, uh, these, the OAuth credentials are exposed uh, via service binding. So when you bind your, uh, the service to your, your application or to your microservice, as part of that binding, it's going to include a number of things. One of those is a URL through which you can do a client uh, credentials binding. It's gonna provide the client credentials themselves, and you're gonna be able to go get an, an OAuth access token from there and be able to uh, then from there consume those services. But if somebody else has uh, some other service, you know, somebody else comes and tries to hit your config server service or tries to hit the service registry service, they're not gonna know those credentials. They're not gonna necessarily know that URL. It's gonna be a lot harder, in fact, hopefully impossible for them to actually consume that uh, unless they are authorized to do so because they were bound to, the, to those services. Yeah, and this is really important for enterprise customers especially because some companies have this luxury of being able to say, all of our microservices and our service registry are all running inside of our controlled network, so we're just gonna trust everything, and if you get to live in that world, that's really awesome. But a lot of enterprises, they really can't say that. The security people come around and say, just because it's running in our internal network, we can't trust everything that's going on. We need a lot more security built around what, uh, for example, Netflix uh, Eureka can do all on its own. So that's some of the stuff we built on top. Yeah, of. The, the, uh, the mistake in security, obviously, is that even though you're behind a wall doesn't mean you're secure. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the security breaches happen because someone inside the wall was able to get the stuff, so it's important. Or unintentionally. Intentionally or unintentionally. It's important to uh, be able to still lock those down even though you're not on a public cloud. And we meant to mention earlier, actually, we'd love for this to be interactive, so if you have questions, raise your hand or yell, um, and we'd be glad to take the questions as they come. We have a Q&A sec section at the end of this talk, but that don't mean you have to wait till then. Just go ahead and yell. Just, just we we'll only ask one thing, is if you do have a question, raise your hand really high and speak really loud, because it's a big room, we can't hear you. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll feel free to answer any question you have. We might answer it with a question, an answer you didn't like, but we'll do it to our best. Here's one right here. Yeah, um, 
so this is all leveraging Cloud Foundry, right? Let me, yeah, let me repeat the question. He wants to know is okay. as you're going from different, you know, development to QA to production or whatever levels of of migration you have of your of your application. He wants to know if it's, is how how seamless is it for for you to do this uh, to go from one to the other. Um, you know, and are you you're hitting a different Eureka? You're hitting a different config server. How is it? How seamless is it for it? Uh, for you to move from one environment to the other. And I, and I think I know the answer to that. I'm gonna let Scott answer it. I'm gonna give you the short answer. I think it's really easy. Go ahead, Scott. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, and it's a timely question because we're on this Cloud Foundry slide. So all of this is based on running this stuff on Cloud Foundry. Um, and part of the benefit we get from that is this reliability where Cloud Foundry automatically makes sure um, these services we're deploying are staying up and running all the time and your apps that are consuming them are staying up and running all the time. And another facet of that to answer your question is Cloud Foundry has this concept of organizations and spaces. So you might create an organization for uh, development, an organization for QA, and an organization for production, and maybe one for staging. And then you can deploy your applications to those orgs and spaces uh, individually as you progress them through. So you might have developers pushing to the development organization and then continuous integration pipelines pushing to all the other ones. So you'd be creating instances of these services we're talking about and pushing your apps to those different orgs and spaces as you progress them through um, development to production. Um, so we can give you more demos of Cloud Foundry and how orgs and spaces work. You can actually see some of that in the lounge, I think, if you want to. And that's kind of the beauty of being able to bind to a service as opposed to refer to a service by, you know, explicitly by the URL is the, the one consuming the service has no idea where that service is until it's told by the binding. And so it, there's this, this level of indirection between, between them. So it doesn't need to know until it needs to know. And so as you move from one environment to the other, as the binding takes, takes hold, that's, that's how it knows where Eureka is. That's how it knows where the config server is. Yeah, you'll be able to see that when we get to doing some demos here in a few minutes. Yeah. Um, right now, when you do the service provisioning, um, you just do CF create service and we're creating stuff in the background. You don't say, I want to scale up that service. We're managing how it's run and how it's um, scaled in the background behind the scenes. So, auto, auto scale according to traffic. Um, in our GA version, we're going to provide one instance of um, each of the services we provide. And then um, in subsequent releases, we'll start to introduce some of the HA capabilities and having multiple instances of them running and things like that. Do you have a sense of where that's at on the roadmap? Um, I'm not going to talk about timelines right now. We can. Uh, Just say, like, in the icebox. Um, no, it's closer than that. It's in our, we're getting ready to do a 1.0 release of this. That's worth saying. Um, it's in public beta right now. We'll have a 1.0 release um, in a matter of weeks, probably. And we're talking about that sort of stuff for 1.1 or maybe as far out as 1.2, but no further than that. It's one of our most requested features that we don't have in the beta right now is, is a little bit more high availability than we're providing in the beta and the 1.0. Suffice it to say, this is not the first time today we've talked about it. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so you're going to hear us use this term service broker a lot. So we just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of what a service broker is and why we're going to use that term so much. Uh, so Service Broker is a way to extend Cloud Foundry's base functionality to provide resources to your application. So the most typical kinds of services that are provided by brokers are relational databases, MongoDB, Redis, RabbitMQ, all those sorts of things that you can imagine an application might want to consume. Um, so all of our services are provided by a service broker that we wrote. Um, Cloud Foundry uh, knows how to talk to a service broker through a REST interface. It's a very simple interface. There's Actually, I believe six REST API call now. There's a fairly new one that we didn't put on the slide. So Cloud, can, or Cloud Foundry will call your service broker and ask it for a catalog of all the services you're providing. Um, and from then on, um, when somebody says, I want to create a service of type X, um, if Cloud Foundry knows that that service is the one you're providing, then it'll call this uh, provision service endpoint. Um, and at that time, you're supposed to create whatever resources you need as a service broker. Um, and then when an application wants to consume that service, there's this create binding call that's made. And all that really does is uh, return to the application all the connection details and the credentials that it needs to talk to that service instance. So you can create one instance of a given service, then have multiple apps bound to it. So that's the difference between provisioning and binding. And then of course you can unbind apps from services and you can delete service instances and the new call is update so you can 
say I want to change some aspect of a service instance and Cloud Foundry can do that. Now, if Cloud Foundry doesn't care where a service broker is deployed, you just deploy your service broker code somewhere and then you register it with Cloud Foundry with a URL and some credentials and then it just starts calling it. It also doesn't care what your service broker is written in. It can be written in Java or Go or Python or PHP, I suppose. I don't yeah. know why you do that, but you can write it in anything you want, deploy it anywhere you want, and then you just register it to Cloud Foundry. So that's yeah, what even if you can do it in PHP, I would. Yeah, I don't know. it's not recommended. Yeah, but what's really cool about this, I mean, never, you know, outside the scope of this talk where we're talking about Spring Cloud Services, just uh, the fact that you can kind of, kind of create your own services just by creating a service broker is a nice feature of Cloud Foundry itself, and so um, just just the nice ability for you to extend your your experience on Cloud Foundry. So if you're running on Pivotal Web Services or Pivotal Cloud Foundry or probably any other Cloud Foundry distribution, uh, there's a way that you can see a services marketplace, and this is an example of what one of those screens might look like. This is from Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So you can see all these services listed here. Each of these boxes are something that's been exposed from some service broker. Um, so you can see ours on here. We have Circuit Breaker. We have Config Server and Service Registry. All three of those services are provided by our broker. Um, all the rest of them on there are provided by other individual brokers. So it's a really nice way to expand out the capabilities of Cloud Foundry through the service broker mechanism. So let's talk about our service broker that we wrote. We wrote our service broker in Java because Java's awesome. Um, we use Spring extensively because Spring is even more awesome. Um, so we made those implementation choices in our service broker, uh, which makes it interesting to talk about in this talk because we're providing you lots of cool things you can use when you're building your Java Spring apps, and we used all exactly those same things to build this broker that's providing those services to you. Um, so we implement the service broker API to Cloud Foundry, um, and we had to do this interesting thing where when Cloud Foundry calls a service broker to provision a new service instance, it gives that service broker 60 seconds to provision that service instance. And if the broker doesn't respond in 60 seconds saying, yeah, it's created, we're good to go, then it assumes something has gone wrong. Some of the services we're provisioning take longer than 60 seconds, so we implemented this little async mechanism where uh, when Cloud Foundry calls our broker and says provision a service instance, we return almost immediately and say, yeah, sure, we did it, everything's good. Um, and all we do in the meantime is put a message on a rabbit queue, um, and then we return to Cloud Foundry and say everything's good. Um, then we have this second application that's listening on that rabbit queue that does all the real work of provisioning that service instance. So then later when an application comes to bind to that service instance, um, if it tries to bind and that worker is still doing its thing, then it's just going to get an error saying instance isn't ready to be bound yet. Or if something goes horribly wrong and the instance can't be created, then it'll get an error. But otherwise, when the service is ready to go, uh, then we reply back on the message queue when the broker gets a AOK -okay message so it knows that it can start being bound to. So this little async mechanism is a nice little thing we put in place to, to separate um, those two responsibilities uh, using RabbitMQ between them, um, which is a microservices design pattern. Um, so that all works really nicely for us. Newer versions of Cloud Foundry actually have, have made this async provisioning mechanism official. So uh, when we're running on newer versions of Cloud Foundry, we have a way to tell it we didn't quite create it yet, we're in the works, and you can keep calling us back and asking us if we're done yet. Um, so that async mechanism is being made official in Cloud Foundry and newer releases. So what this worker app does when it's asked to provision a service instance is it pushes apps to Cloud Foundry. So both of these apps here, this broker app and this worker app, are applications deployed to Cloud Foundry, and what they do is deploy more applications to Cloud Foundry. So now we're getting into this Java Spring Cloud Foundry inception thing going on here. Um, so when you say I want to provision a new service registry service, what we're doing in the background is pushing uh, an instance of Spring Cloud Netflix Eureka to Cloud Foundry and then returning you the route to where that service is when you go to bind to it. Um, this gets to the reliability thing we were talking about. These brokers are running on Cloud Foundry. All the service instances we create are just apps running on Cloud Foundry. Um, so everything is going to stay up through Cloud Foundry's health management, and everything works really well. Yeah, it's a, it's as if all those things that you would have to do manually without Spring Cloud Services, it's as if we wrote them for you and deployed them for you. And I, I use the word as if loosely. It's not as if. It, it is actually what happened. We wrote those, and now our our service broker and worker app will deploy those for you. 
And I mentioned that we wrote it in Java using Spring, so this is a little inventory of the pieces of Spring that we use. All of our apps are Spring Boot, the broker app, the worker app, all of the service instance backing apps are all Spring Boot. And they use different pieces and parts of Spring Cloud depending on the functionality they're providing. They use Spring Cloud connectors to talk to RabbitMQ, and the service broker actually has a little MySQL database that it stores its view of what services have been provisioned and all that. Uh, so we use Spring Cloud connectors to talk to that database. We use Spring Security and Spring Security OAuth 2 extensively, and Craig will show a little bit of that in the demo of what that looks like functionally. Um, but all the OAuth stuff we do is using Spring, Spring Security OAuth 2. Uh, we use Spring Data JPA to talk to that little MySQL database I mentioned. Uh, and we use Spring, AM, Spring AMQP for all of our uh, RabbitMQ interaction between our apps. So we're using as much Spring stuff as we possibly can. Uh, we also use this nice little project called Spring Boot CF Service Broker. And it's basically just a Spring MVC application that implements that service broker REST API. So if you want to write your own service broker in Java, using Spring, this is a little starter project and you just can implement your real business logic of your broker without having to worry about what are all the rest endpoints I'm supposed to implement and what HTTP return codes do I return in this situation or that situation based on what the spec says, all that stuff's implemented for you. It's a really nice little library, which is open source. And then we use Cloud Foundry Java Client. Um, the way that you talk to Cloud Foundry to push apps and manage things in Cloud Foundry, whether it's the <laughs> command line tool or the app manager or anything else is through Cloud Foundry's REST API. And this last library is just a nice Java binding to that REST API, so if you're a Java app, you can push apps, delete apps, do all sorts of things like that inside of Cloud Foundry. Okay, so now we're gonna start talking about each of these three services uh, individually, and we'll give you a quick overview of what they do, and then we'll do some demos of them. Um, so when you say I want to provision a, which one is this? Config server. Config server. When you say you want to provision a config server instance, what you get is a instance of a Spring Cloud config server that we push to Cloud Foundry behind the scenes for you. Um, that Spring Cloud config server can either be backed by a Git repository or a subversion repository. And the things that are in Spring Cloud config server that we support are search paths within a config repo. So if you've got a repo with all your code in it, and one subdirectory within that repo is your config information, you can point us at just that one subdirectory, and we'll just take config information from there. And we support uh, basic auth to the backend repo. Um, and the extra security we've implemented here beyond just um, an app that wants to talk to config server has to have the OAuth token provided in the credentials from the bind. Um, we just make sure that only applications that are using our binding can talk to that config server. So if we provision an instance of a config server and you want some other app um, that's not using our libraries to talk to it, that won't work because you don't know how to do all the OAuth handshaking. Um, so you have to use our binding to get to it and that's an extra level of security. And then we haven't talked much about starters yet. Um, let me get to this last one and then I'll answer your question. Um, so you've probably seen the Spring Cloud starters and this concept of starters in Spring is just a way to pull in one dependency and get a dependency graph pulled into your application without having to have the whole list of things that you need to pull in. Uh, so we have starters for each of our services we're providing. And this starter for config server um, automatically looks at this binding that you got from config server, goes out and talks to that config server and creates a property source that's backed by all the configuration settings in that config server. So you had one dependency to your build file and you bind a config server instance to your application and all of those things in that back configuration are just automatically available in your app. Yeah, question? Uh, just wondering if there's uh, support for or plans for support for other types of uh, configuration sources, such as uh, LDAP or custom server? Yeah, so the question is, um, we support this being backed by either Git subversion today or there are plans to support other things. Um, so everything in Spring Cloud is about an abstraction layer with implementations underneath that abstraction layer. So Spring Cloud provides this config server abstraction layer. It provides the Git and Subversion implementations of that. That's all the implementations provided in the open source project so far. So those are the ones we're leveraging. As more get added to the open source project, we'll pull those into this product as well. So that's kind of the way the release train flows. And actually the Subversion implementation wasn't written by 
the maintainers of Spring Cloud. That was written by somebody else and then committed or submitted as a contribution because they wanted subversion support. So just a little um, plug for open source contribution. Yeah, absolutely. Go nuts. It's not all written by Pivotal. The other, the first, the subversion part of this wasn't written by Pivotal. So if somebody has a need for one of those, write it, contribute it to the open source, and as soon as it's available in open source, we can pull it into this product. Well, that sounds really cool. How, how does this work, Scott? It's all magic, Craig. Okay. Well, let's see. Let's see. What kind of magic? Well, um, you've probably seen this is basically the same kind of diagram you'd see whether you're using Spring Cloud Services or just regular Spring Cloud config, uh, config server. But essentially, you, you take and you put your, your application configuration into a repository such as Git or Subversion. Notice that's not an Octocad up there, so it doesn't have to be GitHub. It can be any Git repository, including one that's inside of your firewall. Um, but you put your configuration properties in there. And this enables you to do a number of things. Uh, primarily, um, it enables you to version it and uh, evolve your properties independently of your application, and, uh, which is a kind of a nice feature when, you, when you're doing configuration. I mean, if you put, if you put your configuration in, in environment variables, it's a little tricky uh, uh, to version those things. If you put your configuration as hard-coded within your application, um, now they have to evolve at the same pace as the application and probably have to be in a microservices based app, gonna have to be duplicated across multiple apps. So instead you put them in Git or Subversion and what happens is this, you tell Spring Cloud uh, configuration server where that repository is and where to find those and it's gonna take those properties, it's gonna suck those in and then it's gonna just make them available to whatever uh, apps or microservices need those and, is, and that are bound to that, that config server. And then it's as if they were part of the properties file or environment variables or what have you. It's just, it's just another set of properties that are available to that application uh, to use as they see fit. So let me show you a demo, a little demo of this. Now I'm gonna go ahead and tell you a couple of uh, caveats of this demo up front. Uh, first off, we are running this not on uh, the public uh, Pivotal Web Services Cloud Foundry. Uh, we're running this on an internal uh, set of environments we work on for uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, our PCF um, Cloud Foundry that we, we run internally. So therefore I am logged into a VPN right now, so who knows what could happen in that context. Conference Wi-Fi, VPN, Conference what could possibly v go yeah, wrong? What could possibly go wrong? Um, so one of the things I do also know is that Occasionally, the browser likes to uh, complain to me about certificates on those servers. Ignore those. I'll, I'll, hopefully, I, I've got past those before I got in here, but in case you see those, it's not, it's not a problem with uh, the config server. It's a problem with just the fact that we're running on a, a test environment. Um, see, what was the other thing I was going to tell you? Oh, I didn't want to go through the exercise, the full exercise of standing this stuff up in front of you, because at some point, it gets boring. I'll work you through kind of a, a mocked up uh, scenario first, and then I'll show you what we really have going on here. So let me uh, switch over, find another window to work in. There we go. Um, finally, we see code. Finally, we see something. Maybe. Uh, let's see. Let's go. Let's go to. Uh, I'm gonna show you stuff that's on this this one first. Uh, so I'm logged into uh, this machine called Red uh, that we call we we name them after colors. So this is Red. And um, I'm in my Seawalls org, and let's just say I have this one app. I'm not going to fully bind it yet, but I have this one simple app called Hi. Let's just say I wanted to, well, it looks like I've already added the config server. Let me delete that just so you can see the full experience. And there we go. Yeah, sure, whatever. Um, it's a shame that this is... Yeah, that warning was just saying you've got an app bound to this thing, you just deleted it, so you might yeah. have to restart that app so it realizes the other thing went away. So here, here we have all the, the different services I could, I could select from. So you see in here config server, service registry, circuit breaker. We're talking about the config server right now, so I'm gonna pick this guy. So here we are. Yeah, this, I'll, I'll pick this plan because the price is unavailable, therefore my money is unavailable, so I'll pick that. Um, we'll select this plan. And it's gonna want a name for that instance, so sure, I'll call it a clever name like config server. Seems like I've done this before. And we'll add it, fantastic. So now I can do really cool things and like I can come up here and uh, maybe bind it to my, to my high application. So let's try that. And I'm gonna go pick the config server from the marketplace and bind it. Oh crap, an error happened. Well, I'll tell you what happened. The reason I'm even going through the exercise of showing you what could go wrong is because I do this every time. This is the, like, probably the only time I've done it and realized that this was gonna happen. 
Um, I always forget to do this. I haven't told it where, get, where my configuration is. I haven't told it anything. It, so the, the service that needs to get its configuration from a Git repository or a Subversion repository has no idea where to go get this stuff from because I didn't finish the setup for the config server. Oh, I didn't mean to go to Marketplace, sorry about that. So I have to go down to the config server down here and click on manage. And of course I gotta log in, so give me a moment to deal with this. Um, yeah, admin, and I've conveniently placed my passwords over here so I don't have to go look them up every time. Okay, TextMate decided to uh, hide from me. I say convenient, that was a complete lie. Where <laughs> this is awesome. Uh, anybody know how to get a window that's not on the screen up onto the screen? <laughs> Here, I'll do this. Bear with me while I copy my uh, password for blue. I said I was going to do that conveniently so I wouldn't have to look it up. Turns, like it turns out I had to do that anyway. All right. While you're doing that, are these um, Spring Cloud services going to be available on AWS? Yes. I'll let Scott deal with that. At some point in time, they will be available. They're actually running in the demo lounge on PWS. We're demoing that during this conference. We sort of set it up there quickly to be able to demo it, but it's not ready to be production supported yet because we're not even in GA. So it'll be running on PWS for a couple of weeks and you can go see that in the demo lounge and then we'll take it away and later on in the year we'll have it um, deployed to PWS for real. All right, so I managed to get the, the right password while Scott was talking. I had copied the wrong one. So I got the right one, I'm logged in and now it's asking me for a choice of Git or Subversion and some URLs and so I can pick one or the other and I happen to have a Git repository handy. I'm just gonna go ahead and fill it in. Uh, github.com slash habuma slash my app config. Notice um, I have the choice if I want to of uh, selecting a specific branch. Uh, default is gonna be master, of course. This seems the most natural choice. Um, if, I, if there is a path within that repository that I wanna dig into, then I can do it by setting a search path there. If, I, if my repository it requires authentication, I can give it my username and password. In this case, it's just a public GitHub repository. You're free to go hit that URL in your browser right now and you'll see what we're looking at. Um, I don't, it's not in a branch and there are no paths, so I'm just gonna click Submit. And at this point, the config server is now set up and I can close out of this window. I can come back over here and I can go back to my app and with any luck at all, I can come over here, bind the service. And it's, you know, it's wanting me to do a restage. I'm not gonna bother doing that because this is not the real demo, the main demo I wanted to show you. It's gonna kick that, I'm gonna do, a, I could restart this, do a restage, you kick off, and then that app now have access to it. Instead, what I've done is I've done a very similar thing already before we came in here. Um, go to blue. Hope it doesn't ask me to log in again. That would be horrible. Uh, and I already have an app out here. It's the, I don't know if you've seen it or not, it's the um, fortune teller example. Uh, Matt Stein, I believe, is the one who wrote it. You may have seen it in one of his talks. You may have also seen it out at the, uh, the Pivotal Lounge. We just decided to leverage that since it's kind of familiar to a lot of people. And so what I have deployed out here are two services, or two apps. I have the fortune UI and the fortune service. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit later when we talk about the discovery server, how these guys talk to each other, how they discover each other and, and work with together. The main thing I wanna focus on right now is the fact that um, the fortune service is bound to the config server and the config server, as it, when I click on manage, of course it's gonna ask me to log in, naturally. That would, that would make sense while people are watching me. And it's gonna show me, in fact, that I am set up on Git. I'm hitting actually the repo in Matt's uh, GitHub uh, space, and that's what's being bound to that. So I've already done this previously, and if I were to go to, uh, let's see, here's the fortune teller app. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Let's just look at the ENV for it, the environment for it, and you can see right up here at the top, uh, among all the other properties that are being made available to this application, including things from properties files and from VCAP and environment variables and system properties and whatnot, right up here at the top, you can see that it's actually pulling in stuff from that GitHub repo. And so you see the spring profiles, you see some uh, 
more interestingly to me, you see some stuff regarding uh, Eureka and different, you know, the lease renewal interval and, and things like that. So these are things that are not hard coded into, in the, the Fortune Teller app. They are instead out there in, in GitHub. And because this application is bound to a configuration server that is pulling its configuration data from that Git repository, it's as if we put these in a properties file or set them in an environment variable as part of this app. But they're external to the app and therefore can be versioned independent of this app. So that's, that's essentially the, the example we're going to stop. We're going to stop, kind of put a pause on this example for now. We're going to talk a little bit about Eureka now, our discovery server, service registry. So that's where Scott picks up. All right. So with service registry, what you get is a Spring Cloud Netflix Eureka instance pushed as an app to Cloud Foundry for you. Um, and there's a really important bit of security we do here. So um, if you know how Eureka works, uh, basically an application can come up and it can register itself to Eureka and say, I'm a, a service that's available for somebody else to discover and consume. Um, another app can come up and register again with the exact same name and say, here I am, here's my name, I'm ready to be consumed. If, a, if two apps come up and register themselves with the same names, the second one's just gonna overwrite the first. Uh, so that can happen accidentally, just because two apps happen to pick the same name to register with, or that can happen maliciously because a second app is coming along and saying, I'm gonna masquerade as that first app and do a man in the middle attack by stealing all the traffic that's meant to go to one service, send it to me instead, maybe do something with it, like store it off away, and then you know, return what the other service would have returned. So um, there's a, this ability to do a man in the middle attack against Eureka just because um, it doesn't have that kind of security built into it because a lot of people don't need that. You can just trust the applications that are keeping their names straight and that nothing malicious is going on. In the enterprise environment, a lot of people care a lot that you can't do that sort of man in the middle attack or you can't unintentionally register two things with the same names. So the security we put in place here is when an application registers with Eureka and says, here's my name, um, we record some metadata along with that registration, including some information that is traveling along in this OAuth2 token. Anything else that wants to come up and update that registration record with the same name better have that same OAuth token or it's not gonna work. They're gonna get an error and say, you can't update this registration record. Um, so the first application that comes in with a name and registers with that name from then on is the only application that can ever update any information about that registration again. It's a really important bit of security that we've added on top of the open source Spring Cloud and Netflix. Um, and then we also have a starter for uh, Spring Cloud Service Registry um, that automatically configures the client side of Eureka with the information that's in the, the service credentials with where the Eureka server is and what the OAuth2 token is you need to talk to it, or the client ID, um, and makes all that stuff wired up automatically. Yeah, so, so how does that work? It's just magic, Craig. Magic. Wow. Uh, probably should have had Michael Carducci join us for this talk in that case, but um, anyway, here, here we go. Um, this, this is, again, a very familiar picture to you, and uh, it'll walk through uh, the example in a minute. We have this, the, you saw when I pulled up the, uh, in Cloud Foundry on blue, you saw we had a fortune teller UI and a fortune teller service. Uh, both of those are individual applications deployed into Cloud Foundry. And so fortune teller service uh, comes along, and fortune teller service is bound to the service registry, and it says, hey, hello, my name is fortune teller service. And here's where I live. Here's how people can contact me if they need me. Um, just let me know, or let them know where I'm at. And so Fortune Teller UI later needs to consume that service. And so Fortune Teller UI, also bound to the service registry, says, hey, uh, tell me a little bit about where the Fortune Teller uh, service is. Where can I find one of these? And so it asks that question. And the uh, service registry responds simply by saying, this right here, I'm sure everybody can read that just fine. Actually, that's, that's an abridged version of it. It's just an XML set of information that comes back and tells more than you'd ever want to know about that service, including if there are multiple instances of that service where it can find each of those instances at. And so the Fortune Teller UI, UI basically takes that information and uses it to make a call over to Fortune Teller Service and says, hey, give me a random fortune. It makes kind of a call like this. And what's really cool about this, um, especially if you're using uh, Spring Cloud, if you've ever, I don't know if you've used Spring Cloud to do this or not, but if you have, you've seen that when you, you're given a REST template, 
And with REST template, you can actually make a GET request or a POST request or whatever type of request you need to make to not the actual physical URL on Cloud Foundry, which you really don't even need to know. Instead, you make a call to the service name slash whatever the path is. So here, it's making a call to Fortune Service. Under the cover, some magic is happening, um, and it's you know discover it's looking this information up uh, from the uh, cloud from the, the service registry, and then it's able to map that to the actual physical URL. But in your code, you don't need to know where it's physically bound to. You just simply say, hey make a call, make this get request to Fortune uh, service, give me, some, give me a random uh, fortune from that. So let me show you a little bit more about that. And it also reminded me while Scott was talking, there's something I failed to show you. I meant to, but I completely forgot about it in, in the uh, config server. And it's also the same thing I'm gonna show you here, but applies to the other services as well, such as the uh, service registry. So I don't wanna look at red anymore, let's look at blue. We have the config server here, uh, let's see. The config server, as I said, is bound to, oops, I clicked the wrong one. I love it when I do the wrong thing. It's, you can see it's, it's, it's bound here to the um, fortune service. And so as part of that binding, now you don't, generally don't need to mess with this, but it is available for you to look at. As part of this binding, I can go and show credentials. And in there, what you see is the access token URL, or the access token URI from which a, uh, this, uh, this particular application, this fortune service, can go get a token to, to be able to use it. So, uh, so uh, I'm sorry, so a client can, could, this application can get, be a client to the config server, request this token, and now it can consume data from the config server. Without this, without the client ID, without the client secret, there is no way that you're gonna be able to actually consume this from the config server because of that security. If we go look at the, the kind of the same thing, um, for the service registry, you're going to see kind of the, the same sort of deal going on, although it's uh, kind of hidden at the moment. Probably some weird thing going on. In my, there we go. You're going to see that, in fact, it also has an access token URI, a client ID, and a client secret. There is no way that anyone else coming along is going to be able to go hit that service registry and, and request services by their name without actually having a good token for that. And so, in this case, the Fortune service wanting to consume that is going to use this URL, give it this client ID and secret, it's gonna do an OAuth client credentials grant, it's gonna get back a token, and then it's gonna be able to make, use that token on every single request to the service registry to ask for services or to bind itself, uh, or, uh, register itself within the service registry. And when we say the client app needs to take those three things and create that token, you don't have to write the code to yeah. do that. That's what is in that Spring Cloud Services starter. You pull that as an dependency. It's already got all the code that knows how to take those three bits of information, go talk to the OAuth server, get the right token, pull the token back into the client app, and then pass that token with every call to each one of these servers. So that's not code you have yeah. to go This write. is completely under the cover stuff. I just wanted to kind of go in there and show you kind of where you could see kind of what's happening under the covers and where, you know, where it's actually gonna make this request for that token. But generally speaking, you need not worry about that. All right, so as you saw, I have um, the Fortune service is bound to the service registry. The, likewise, the, um, Fortune UI is also Apparently, fun stuff has happened while I was away. It's going to see a whole bunch of app crash. Uh, it's also uh, registered to, or bound to the service registry, and it has its own set of credentials, unique from those of the other of the of the uh, the, the Fortune service. So it's going to be able to consume those as well. Now, so what's different there between the binding to the service and the binding to the UI? Um, essentially, the the URI is going to be the same, mm -hmm. but the client ID and secret are different because this is a different client. So those things are unique per application that's bound to the service. So that makes it impossible for one app to kind of just sniff and find out somebody else's client ID. Right. And as a consequence of that, everything I showed you on that slide with all the arrows is going to be able to take place. And so when we go into the Fortune Teller UI, the Fortune Teller UI is, is and I'll show you some code here in a second, the Fortune Teller UI is going to be able to make that call to the service, get a fortune back, and display it on the page, and you know, you do learn a lot from your mistakes. One of those is I should have made sure that the passwords were a little easier to grab, so that's a good thing. And 
I can hit refresh and it says, if you feel you're right, stand firm by your convictions. I, I'm pretty sure I was wrong, so I'm not gonna mess with that one. You, you get the idea. Let me show you a little bit of the code that actually makes this happen. So, and it's, it's shockingly not much. Uh, if you look at the, the build file for this, for the Fortune service, you're gonna see in there, among other things, you're gonna see the starters for Spring Cloud Services, Config Client, and Spring Cloud Services Service Registry. It has some other stuff necessary to kind of make the app work, uh, but these are the things that are gonna bring in the stuff that Scott spoke about to automatically um, you know, bring all the dependencies necessary to make this work, bring in um, the uh, property source so it knows where to get the stuff from. In the case of config, cl config client, it's gonna be able to know to get the stuff from um, the config server and so forth. And so when you uh, go look at the code, let's see, where am I looking here? Yeah, me and Scott went through this exercise yesterday and I, can, I remember looking at this thinking to myself, God, my gosh, there's like no code to talk about. In fact, you'll remember, Scott, I was looking, uh, yeah, oh yeah, th this is just domain, there's nothing in here. This, these are just controllers, there's nothing in here. These are just, sir, there's nothing in here. This is just application code, boring stuff nobody cares about, right? Has nothing to do with, uh, of course, it's the most important thing in your app, but it has nothing to do with, uh, uh, what we're with Spring Cloud Services. The main thing we, we care about is the fact that we've enabled Discovery Client. That one line right here, this, this, this is, you know, hands down the most important thing in this, this application.java file, this configuration class, is it's what enables the application to know to go to um, the discovery server to look up its services and in this particular case, because it is the uh, Fortune service, to register itself with, that, with the uh, discovery service. How it registers itself, that's gonna be down here. Uh, do we? I always forget where this is put, bootstrap. You're gonna have um, a spring application name is Fortunes. That's gonna be the name of the service. So when we go look, when the client, I, or when the UI starts looking this thing up, it's gonna look it up with the name Fortunes. My slides said Fortune service, do the mental mapping. I, I probably should have fixed the slide to, to match this, but it's gonna look it up with the name Fortunes. As far as the uh, <clears throat> Cloud configuration, it's gonna have a little bit of extra information here. I think this has been made easier lately, am I? Yeah, yeah, yeah those, the starter will do that for you, those lines yeah, this, aren't. Yeah, the starter necessary. is gonna take care of this part for you, so. Yep. And that's it for the fortune teller service as far as the configuration. Notice there was no, uh, there's, aside from enable uh, discovery client, there was nothing in there to enable config client. It's because it's really not necessary if, if that, that starter is taking care of that business for you, it's making sure that that stuff's available. All right. Let's talk okay. about the circuit breaker. So the last service is the circuit breaker dashboard. Hopefully you're all familiar with the circuit breaker pattern. You have service A that needs to talk to service B, and if for some reason service B goes away, you <laughs> want service A to act in some predictable and graceful way to the fact that it can't talk to service B anymore. So typically what you like to do is have some fallback mechanism where service A can respond with um, some useful data to whoever's calling it that may not have everything it could because it can't talk to service B anymore. Um, so if that sort of circuit breaker pattern is in use and something is going wrong, you would want to be able to see that that's going on. Uh, first of all, you want that circuit breaker to be tripped automatically, and second, you want to be able to see that there's something happening that's not the usual thing that's happening. So that's what this enables. Um, so when you provision a circuit breaker dashboard instance, uh, this is the most complex of our three services. That's why we left it for last. Um, you actually get three things. I'm going to tell you what these are real quick, and then we'll have a picture that will show it much more clearly. Um, so you get an instance of a Spring Cloud Netflix Hystrix dashboard. This is the UI that's going to give you a view of how things are running right now. Then you get an instance of Spring Cloud Netflix Turbine Server. And what Turbine does is it aggregates all metrics coming in from all the things that are hooked up to the circuit breaker and just brings them all into one central aggregation point so that this dashboard can read that information out of it. And then you get an instance of a Pivotal Rabbit and Q service, which is um, how those metrics are sent to Turbine. So the picture will explain it much better. And of course, we have a starter that um, automatically wires all this stuff up so your client can talk to the Rabbit server and then the Rabbit server can uh, the turbine server can pull its information off of Rabbit. So how's this work, Scott? This is even more magic. I'm going to let you ones. tell me about this magic because <clears throat> I think you can probably handle this one better than I can. Okay. 
Um, so these are the three components that uh, I was talking about a second ago. We have um, your client applications on the far left-hand side, and then you have this queue that metrics are going to be put onto, and then you have uh, the turbine server in the middle. This just animates, the things just start flowing, right? And then we have the Hystrix dashboard on the end. So your client application is just sending metrics about how things are working onto this queue. Turbine takes all the metrics coming from all the different client applications, puts them on one queue, and gives the Hystrix dashboard one place to get all those from. And then you get this nice UI that tells you what services are up, what services are down. Um, if uh, service A is trying to call service B and it can't, it's going to show you that. Um, so those are how all those components work together. Yeah, because what you're going to have to do normally, if you weren't using Spring Cloud Services, you're going to have to, <coughs> excuse me, you're going to have to stand up the, the Hystrix dashboard. You're going to have to, within the Hystrix dashboard, you're going to have to go enter a URL for the, the stream of, of metrics you want to look at. If you want to, you know, look at metrics across multiple services, now you've got multiple streams, you're going to have to go stand up Turbine to do that and enter that Turbine URL. The, with Spring Cloud Services, you don't have to do that. With Spring Cloud Services, uh, the Turbine bit is handled for you through this queue. Um, you basically don't even have to go in there and enter a URL for it. It's just, it's bound, everything's bound up appropriately. So when you go into the Hystrix dashboard, you see the metrics directly. You don't have to go enter a URL or anything. Okay. Oh, I forgot about this slide. Yeah. <clears throat> so this service does have one additional wrinkle. Um, so like we said, when you uh, bind to a circuit breaker dashboard service, what your app is actually getting is a rabbit queue that it could start putting metrics on. And of course, that putting metrics on the queue isn't something your app is doing explicitly. You're including one annotation that says um, this is a Hystrix command. And then every time that method is hit, this, the metrics are automatically getting put on the queue for you. Um, so if you don't use Rabbit in your application for any messaging already, really all you do is include the starter. You get that Rabbit uh, connection behind the scenes. You don't even know it's there, but the Hystrix infrastructure knows it's there and starts sending stuff to it. But what if you are using Rabbit in your application? Now you're going to have two connection factories, the one we're creating behind the scenes for uh, the Hystrix data to use and the other one that your client application is using. In that scenario, you have to do a little bit of coding um, because we have two connection factory beans and we need to know which one is for which. So in that scenario, you'd add this little bit of code on top, which is just annotating the connection that we're getting for Hystrix with this at Hystrix, Hystrix connection factory annotation. And that just tells the Hystrix infrastructure, this is the rabbit connection I want you to use. And then in your own uh, client code, you could use something like an at primary annotation and then that connection factory is going to get auto-wired into all of your Spring AMQP infrastructure or whatever it is you're using. If you're using three different um, Spring AMQP connections internally, then you might have other qualifier annotations on the bottom. That's kind of how you design it. The important part is you can use this Hystrix connection factory annotation to tell the Hystrix infrastructure this is the one you want to use. And behind that call to connection factory, Hystrix connection factory, our code is going out finding out that there's a, a circuit breaker service bound to your application, getting all the rabbit credentials from that, and creating that connection factory. Well, I'm going to ask a dumb question. And no, I'm not going to ask you how it works. Well, I am, but not, not, I'm not expecting a magic answer. Uh, I, this is a serious question. It's, it's a question I probably should have asked before we got up here, but I'm sure everybody I else might want, to, have, yeah. might want to know this. Because then I'd have the answer prepared. Yeah, well, you might know this. Um, Hystrix connection factory. If, am I, would I be mistaken to say that that's just a qualifier annotation? It is just a qualifier annotation. That's what I figured it was. So it's, it's basically a, a, an annotation that is itself annotated with qualifier, and then internally within uh, Spring Cloud Services, we're looking for that specific qualification, that specific qualifier when it comes time to pick this. That's so it's, we're basically doing the same thing you would do in Spring if you had multiple rabbit, yep. uh, rabbit beans to work with. We're, we're, Qualifying one is a Hystrix connection factory. I'm glad I knew the answer to that question. I was nervous there. For I a thought second. that was the answer, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> okay. And let's see the circuit breaker. Time. Circuit breaker is fun because we get to break stuff. I mean, it's in the name, circuit breaker. Let's see how let's see how this will work. All right. So I'll, I'll show you the code first since we're here. Uh, I have to go see if I know where to find it at. Um, I believe it'll be in here. Oh, actually, I believe it's not in here. Where did I put this? 
or where did Matt put this more accurately? It's in the UI, right? It's in the UI. No wonder I'm lost. Okay. Yeah, so circuit breaker is always from the perspective of the caller. So the caller is the one that's got the instrumentation saying, I'm, in this case, the UI, I'm trying to call the server. Are those calls working or not? And if those calls start to fail from the caller's perspective, then that's really what we want to know about. Yeah, so what we have here is we have this one method called random fortune that's going to be called from the controller so it can serve up a fortune. And it's going to simply use rest template to do a get for object. And notice the URL there. I mean, this has nothing to do with circuit breaker, but it's, it's worth mentioning. Yeah, this uh, is back to service registry again. It's going back to service registry and looking up a service by the name fortunes. And so, you know, if you, if you put in your browser right now, HTTP colon slash slash fortunes, it's, it's not going to work all that well. Uh, you can try it with curl, same effect. Uh, in fact, if you were even logged into the VPN and doing the same thing that we're doing here, you still wouldn't find fortunes because there is no machine whose name is fortunes. It's using this name under the covers. It's using um, some trickery to go say, hey, go find me the service named fortunes. And then essentially it rewrites this URL before actually sending the request. But if it works, great, we're going to get a fortune back. We're going to get some random, for oops, some random fortune from that service. If it doesn't work, however, if things are, are flaky, let's just say the service just went away, which is an entirely possible scenario. But if, if that, it was on Cloud Foundry, it'd come right back. Yeah, it'd come right back. But in the, in the meantime, or if you really, like, not only removed it, somebody, I mean, you not only killed it, you removed it, you blasted it away, or it's, it, for some reason, otherwise unhealthy, maybe this thing starts throwing an exception. I don't know, whatever reason, this is not working. If that were the case, we don't want the application to fall over because some service down here is failing. We don't want a cascading failure to bring the whole thing down. We'd like to have some nice, easy way of telling people, hold on, maybe things aren't built going so well right now, come back, ask later kind of thing. Uh, so that's in the case of the fortune teller service, that's what's going on. And here, we've annotated it with Hystrix command. And Hystrix command basically is telling it, this could go wrong. And when it does go wrong, I want you to turn around and call fallback fortune instead, which is this method down here. The main rule between a, of a Hystrix fallback method is it has to have the same signature as the method that it's falling back for, uh, which is pretty easy when you don't take any parameters. But um, if this were to fail for any reason, this gets called. As soon as it becomes healthy again, it goes back to doing what it was doing before. So. And this is also where the metrics come from. So this at Hystrix command, which is a part of Spring Cloud open right. source, the fact that you have that on there also means every time this method gets called, some metrics are going to be captured and sent off to this RabbitMQ, which goes to Turbine, which then goes to the dashboard. Indeed. So here we are. We're, we're back at the app. I'm just going to show you it working a few, a few more times. Hopefully it works. Um, yeah, this, I think fear has hurt me, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, your shoes, you know, my shoes are not making me happy today. I, these are not comfortable at all. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to kind of come over here. And uh, where are we at? We're at the UI. I want to go to. I want to go to this. Helps if I'm in the right spot. I want to go to the service, and I'm, I'm just going to kill the service. I'm just going to purposefully bring it down. Sure, let's stop that. So there is no fortune service. It's it's gone. I uh, come back over here to the app. I hit refresh. Your future is unclear. Because what happens is when we tried to make that request, there was no service to be to be found. It it tried to make the call, or couldn't find the service, failed, something went wrong. Hystrix command caught it, <coughs> turned it around, and sent it to the, the fallback method. And so I can keep doing this all day long, and until that service comes back, my future is going to be unclear. I'll bring the service back. But before I do, let me, let me go over here. I, I, I got to show you the, uh, the Hystrix dashboard. And the easiest way to get to that is to come over here. Find the, uh, uh, yeah, find the, go to the circuit breaker, do manage, wait for it. And here we have the circuit breaker dashboard. Now we only have that one circuit breaker, so it's not terribly interesting at the moment. Um, but I'll see if I can add some life to it. Uh, totally wrong window. This is the one I wanted. All right, see if I can add some life to it by just hitting refresh on this a few times. And you can see it's actually doing something right now. That little ball turned red because it's, it's unhealthy at the moment. And you see 100% failure rate over there on the right? Yeah, the percent failure is pretty, pretty high at the moment, I would yeah. say. Uh, things are not good. I think you get much higher than 100% failure yeah. rate, can you? Uh, yeah, if you have 110% failure, you, you're really in trouble. 
Uh, let's see if I can find my window that I drug away. Um, we're on blue, that's good. Let's go back to, let's see if I can bring that, that fortune service back up and get things back in business. Now it takes a moment or two um, for this thing to not only start, but also for it to tell Eureka that it's back in business. And so this is not gonna work see immediately. That on the Eureka dashboard, right? I'm sorry? We could see that on we the We could Eureka see that dashboard. on the Eureka dashboard. But we did that in the keynote the other night, so that's right. Yeah, so I'm just gonna hit refresh here for a little while while we wait for things to get better. And um, like I said, it may take, there we go. It looks like it's back. And notice I'm starting to get uh, my failure rates going down. I'm starting to see more green numbers over here in the Hystrix dashboard, so things are, are healthy now. But I didn't have to, like I would normally would have to do with Hystrix, I didn't have to go in and tell it where that, where that stream of metrics was. It's just because it's bound, because the Hystrix dashboard is bound to our application, it's just gonna know where to get that, that, those metrics from. And under the covers, as Scott mentioned, it's via that uh, message broker. All right. Uh, wrong Feels like it? about it, doesn't it? Well, you Three tell services, me. we've talked about all three of them. Um, so that's what we came to tell you about today. Um, this is available on uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry and Betaform today. It'll be available in a 1.0 GA uh, very soon, and at some point later in the year on Pivotal Web Services. Um, so what questions do we have? Now's a great time for some questions. Or some answers, if you have any. Yes. Uh, the, a property from the config server. Um, within the app itself, actually, I don't know. Matt, is there? Does the app itself show any properties from the config, from the config server? I don't think so. It's all like Eureka config. So yeah. No. Yeah, it doesn't. I mean, it could. And you could use like a configuration properties annotation from Spring Boot to inject it into a property, just like you would any other property. But uh, as it's written now, it does not. Any other questions? There we go. When, when the server breaker is active, uh, are you calling the actual service every time waiting for it to fail? Or are you calling the callback method to get the service to fail? How are you doing to kind of cover to know when the service is back up? So the question is, how does, essentially the question is, how does Eureka know that that service has been reinstated so that when I am making that call, or I guess, how does my, my, my client, my, my service registry client know that that service is now healthy again, uh, and therefore I can, start, I can continue making calls instead of going to the fallback method? And you know what? I have a theory on how that works, but I, honestly, I've never actually given it much thought. Do you happen to know? Well, the circuit breaker, like that app Hystrix command, there's no sort of artificial calls being made to that service being called. All Hystrix is doing is measuring of all the calls that are made from the caller side, how many are succeeding and how many are failing. Um, so there's no sort of heartbeat going to it or anything. It's just capturing the metrics from the actual calls from, in this case, the UI to the service. I think it just needs to Yeah, but how does it know? It goes half open and then it, then it, tries, it tries to connect every now and again. Yeah, that's, that's, about, oh, okay. that's what, what I believe saying. to be the case is it tries yeah. every now and again, but I wasn't gonna answer that without knowing for sure. Well. Yeah. yeah. And, and, no, I'm sorry, I misunderstood that. Yeah, there's an algorithm inside of Hystrix that figures that out. And if you go out to the uh, Netflix Hystrix documentation, it'll document what that algorithm is to figure out if it's down how many of the tries it actually tries to send again versus how many it just automatically um, short circuits or open circuits. Yeah. Um, so you can get the details there on what that algorithm is and how you can configure and tune that algorithm. Yeah, there's a lot of properties you can configure Eureka with, probably more than you'd ever care to know, but uh, yeah. that's, 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 and Hystrix that's too. one of them. Yep. Yeah, so yeah, same thing with Hystrix and Config Server Thanks, to Gary. some degree. Yes. How does, how does it know these? Yeah, the question is how does this work if you're not writing a, a Java app to run as a server, but it's iOS or Android or mobile? Yeah, what, what, what you're gonna do there is you're not going to hit any of these services directly from a mobile client, whether it be JavaScript or Android or iOS or anything like that. 
you're not going to hit those services directly because you got to, never mind security, you have a whole other problem before that. You've got to figure out where they are. Uh, you don't even know what the URL is for them. And so it's not part of Spring Cloud Services, but we have, that's where Zool comes in. And so Zool can c capture one or more other services and proxy to them through a single, uh, single API URL. And so it's, at, it's through that same API URL that you can also do security. Uh, and that can be OAuth, it can be basic auth, whatever you, you deem appropriate for your app. And the client can deal with it just like it would any other, if it was a single API. Uh, I do believe, it just to kind of plug an article, I didn't write the article, but uh, Dr. Dave Sire wrote an excellent series of articles on the Spring blog over the, the last several months. Uh, he goes into exactly that, that scenario. How do you write a client? He, in his case, it wasn't like an Android or iOS. It was Angular, if I remember right, but an Angular yeah. client uh, consuming services that are secured, and he's doing it right through Zool. Yes? I wasn't hearing that. Were I'm you? not sure I caught the question. Yeah. Is there a specific model that's used by a config server? Is that the question? Security model? Uh, would we expose the security model outside of? Well, I mean, the, the whole idea, I, I don't know the answer. I, I can't say definitive yes or no on that, but my knee-jerk reaction is to say no. Uh, the whole point of that is we don't want anyone to consume that config server unless they are bound to it. Um, they don't, we don't, I mean, in theory, I suppose that would be a nice thing you could do is you could just say, hey, here's configuration. Everybody come, you know, and, and get it. But uh, we're thinking of more of a uh, cloud-native enterprise type application where you really don't want that. You want the configuration private and only available to those uh, those services that are actually bound to the configuration server. And so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to expose that outside. But once they're bound to it, it's a piece of cake. I mean, we automatically, as you've seen, I mean, there's no code we wrote in the, in the Fortune Teller app. There was no code written to actually go negotiate that security to get to those properties, it just, it just works. Um, you could certainly go you know, dig into the properties yourself and do, do it yourself if you wanted to, but um, there, I, can, I can think of no reason why we would ever want to necessarily expose that outside of, to, to anything that's not bound to the config server directly. How would you secure this outside of CloudFound? Yeah. Uh, you would, well, you, you would do what we did. You would yep. just do it yourself. You'd write the same code we did, but using, uh, you'd Spring, have to write it yourself. Yeah, you'd use Spring Security, Spring Security for OAuth. Yeah, and this is a good time to, to plug the one talk we were going to want to plug is um, the way that we did all of this security with Spring um, Security OAuth, that is um, some fairly complicated stuff to get your head around and use. Um, there's another talk tomorrow afternoon that is this Securing Microservices with Spring Cloud Security. That talk is by Will Tran, who's on our team and helped us implement a lot of this security. He's not going to talk about our code, but he's going to talk about all exactly the same tools and techniques we used in our code in some other sample apps that he's got. So if you're interested in how that OAuth 2 stuff works and how to write Spring apps that do the same things we did, you should definitely go to that talk. Absolutely. He'll answer all those questions better than we can up here. Yes. Yeah, all the Hystrix uh, metrics are going to say is, did this call work or did it not work? 
Um, from there, um, hopefully you're getting some logs from one side or the other that you can go inspect logs for those applications and try to figure out, okay, it's working. I'm getting some failures. They're not enough failures that the circuit is opening, but I'm getting some failures, and what am I seeing in logs that's only when I'm passing this parameter that I'm getting a failure or some condition like that. Well, the, I'm not sure if I understand the... Yeah, it's, 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 the circuit breaker is on a given, well, the, the metrics you're seeing is on a given circuit breaker, not on a given service. So there could be multiple yeah. circuit breakers within that service. But if you have multiple instances of that service, which circuit breaker is it reporting on? Um, and you've got to remember the circuit breaker is always from the caller side. Right. So the circuit breaker is recording, is the caller able to talk to this thing or not? It's not reporting what's going on on the back end side. All it knows is it, did it work or not. Yeah. That's all it knows. And at that point, if you start seeing, you know, failures, like if you have five service, five instances and, a, and like 20% of them seem to be failing, that means one of them is, is probably dead. Now it's, you need to go a little deeper and the, the dashboard's not going to help you with, figure that out, but you can go a little deeper, look at the logs for some of those services and, uh, and maybe uh, do some of this, you know, we talked a little bit about tracing in the keynote last night. Some of that tracing might give you some of that information as well. It's not something we are offering in Spring Cloud Services currently, but. So Circuit Breaker could help you see that some percentage of those calls are failing. What's going on on that back end? You're going to have to start digging into that service and what's going on with it. I got a question over here. He, he's eagerly asking, raising his hand. Can this be done on a private cloud? Um, yeah, Pivotal Cloud yeah. Foundry is basically Pivotal's implementation of Cloud Foundry that runs on private cloud. Right. So you can install Pivotal Cloud Foundry on vSphere, on OpenStack. Um, you can install it on AWS. If you, if you consider that private cloud, if you have your own AWS. So you can install Pivotal Cloud Foundry on any of those, and then you can install um, Spring Cloud Services on top of that. Right. And there's a guy back here who will be happy I to mean, sell you that. I mean, essentially, uh, red and blue that I was showing you, those are private clouds. Well... Yeah, but conceptually, it's the you know as far as the network topology is concerned, it's it would be very little different than what you would have as a internal private cloud versus yeah. a uh, just some test environment I have that's also behind the firewall. Yes. I'm sorry, I I, I couldn't yeah. make, make that out. Basically. Um, what are the conditions that a circuit breaker would be considered to fail? Um, the most obvious one is if an exception is thrown. Uh, but there's other scenarios, such as if it's uh, being slow to respond, and there's configuration you can put in there to say, hey, if it hasn't, if it's you know being kind of uh, sluggish, maybe it hasn't reached some uh, you know some threshold of, of of response time, then that's considered also a failure. Uh, but the easy the easy one to talk about is if an exception is thrown. If an exception is thrown, that that broke, therefore fall back and do something else. Can, um, I don't believe, if, if a service returns a specific value, I don't believe you can, although, well, you can. You just have to write some code around it where you yourself are saying, if this happens, throw an exception. If not, don't. Yeah. Um, but it's not really, that's not the intent because the, the circuit breaker is more about the, um, the health of a service, not necessarily what the service is, is serving. And, I mean, certainly you could say, you know, you make the call, and if it returns something you don't like, throw an exception, which would then make a fallback happen. You could do that. That's just not really what it's intended for. Yes?
Yeah, so you, you'd like to, you know, certain failures to not necessarily be failures. You would like them to uh, not necessarily retry in those cases, like if a network were down, you wouldn't want to keep retrying knowing the network's down. Actually, I'm not sure why you wouldn't want to do that. If the network's down, it's still going to fall back, and eventually the network will come back. Oh, can you define a distinct call, a fallback behavior depending on what the failure was? Um, good question. You know, I'll, I'll, I honestly don't know. Yeah, that would again be the be Hystrix a, open source project, and we have to research what its capabilities are in that regard. Yeah, one thing I, I, I sort of, as you were asking this, I thought you were asking a different question. So I'm going to answer the question I thought you were asking, though. Um, and that is, with the Fortune Teller UI, uh, application, it, it's really a nice, simple application. That's one of the beauties of it is it's, it's simple enough you can kind of get your head around all the pieces pretty easily because there's only two. Um, in, in a typical microservices architecture, you wouldn't necessarily at that UI, that be the only place where you would have circuit breakers. You, you, those, that might call a service, which calls another service, which calls another service, which calls another service. You don't know how deep this goes, but at all levels, you could have circuit breakers. Mm -hmm. And so failures and fallbacks could happen anywhere in the application. And kind of the, the general rule of thumb, I've heard two different people say this, so I, can't, I don't know who to give the quote to, uh, the general rule of thumb is where do, I, where do you place circuit breakers? You place them where things might go wrong. Yeah. And so it could be anywhere in the app. And in most of these sample apps, what you'll usually see also is you try to call some external service through REST template, and if it doesn't work, you have some hard-coded value. That's the easiest example. What you might have in a real-world case is you try to call one service, and if you start seeing failures, you might call some backup service that is maybe an older version with less functionality, but you want to give it a shot. And if that doesn't work, then the third step is you return some empty value or some hard-coded value that things can consume. So you can stack them deeper that way as well. Right. What else? Here's one. Go. Oh. Uh, are you talking about the configuration repository? I couldn't hear you terribly well, but yeah, configuration repository. Uh, how would you deal with dev versus QA versus production? Uh, would you have a different repository? Would you have the same repository? Is that the question? Yeah. Uh, I, it depends. Uh, what do you want to do? Uh, I mean, in, in theory, uh, they could be the same repository, but they're probably not, uh, because you probably don't want to have production uh, properties in your repository that your dev and QA teams are also hitting. Uh, depends on depends on the nature of the properties. In some cases, it may not matter. It could be different branches in the same repo. Yeah, if you that's to set it up that way. That's what I was thinking. Is, is in that case, you probably want to go with branches or, or something, or you know, something along those lines. And maybe, you know, there's di all sorts of different scenarios. Just as just as there are different ways of migrating your code through through a repository and different and branches and 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 whatnot. The same thing would apply here. So one one scenario that I thought of while standing here answering this is you could have in your branch. A dev, config, a dev config, but in your master, it's production. If at any point you needed to merge that in, you could. You just, of course, you need to take care not to merge um, things that are sensitive uh, from dev or, or that might break production. But still, you, you could do that same kind of thing. You could have multiple paths. Uh, so you could say slash production is production configs and slash dev is dev configs. I mean, there's a lot of scenarios. It kind of just depends on what seems most appropriate for you. Or you could do it the... Uh, the good old-fashioned way, and just have distinct repositories for each one. Yeah. Next question over here. Nope. Absolutely not. Would it be a bad practice to have a microservice call another microservice? That's a the very good practice. It's in fact, you saw this happening. It wasn't obvious, but it was in fact happening uh, because both um, the both the fortune teller service and the fortune teller URI both called out to another microservice. The service being config server and the service being uh, service registry. So, so you're worried about, you're worried about uh, testing. So when you're testing microservice one, you're also indirectly testing two. Well, certainly if they are deployed in the cloud, as you've described, yeah, that would be the side effect of that. And so uh, your scenarios are, well, you just accept that, or you 
for the purpose of testing, bind it to a, a faked out version or something like that. But the, the truth is, I mean, that's, that's at a, a, a more closer to production test. That's, that's when you're doing more of an integration style testing, and which is a good style of testing. So in that case, yes, you would still want to do that. But when you're, when you're developing locally on your machine and you're running the same service, it's just a web app. And it's making a call out to some something and, and so it, there's no reason it has to actually hit a real service. It could hit a fake service. You can do things like, a uh, simple thing you can do is um, use Spring MVC's test, Spring MV, or Spring MVC client testing that was introduced in Spring 3. something, I think. I forget when it, was, it came around. And then you can basically mock out the responses. It's, it's as if it's going to, the, to another service, but it never even hits the network. It just responds immediately. That's not an old pattern, it's a good pattern. Right. Right. Sure. Sure. And so you're saying, so you have a controller calling service one, service two, and service one doesn't know about service two, and that, that's clean. The, the same scenario could happen with microservices. I mean, it'd be nice to keep those independent of each other. And so when I say a microservice is calling another microservice, I probably don't mean necessarily, although yes, you could do this. Um, but you don't necessarily mean this one calls this, this one calls this, and then this one also calls this one. I don't necessarily mean that. It could mean this, you know, your app calls a microservice and then that microservice calls yet another microservice. It, it, it itself is a client for another service. Because at, at the end of the day, your UI is itself conceptually a microservice. It just doesn't expose like a REST API. It exposes a human-facing API. Yeah. In, in a well-designed monolith, you know, if you're drawing a dependency graph within your code, you typically want that dependency graph to be like a tree that goes yes. down without a bunch of spaghetti lines going sideways, right? In microservices, it's the same thing. If you have so, layers of services, you still want a nice, clean dependency graph without a lot of spaghetti and lines going sideways and things like that. It doesn't really change that. Yeah. So to go back to your original question, you ask, is it a considered a bad practice, or uh, I think that's how you word it, is, is it considered a bad practice for one microservice to call another microservice? The answer generally is no, it's not. But depends on how what where, where they live within that that tree of dependencies, uh, it may be. So well, the, the microservice. Well, I'm going to say something, and then I'm going to take it back. But just to answer your question, and, and yes, in a sense, a microservice is exposing a REST API, therefore it does have a controller. Well, but a microservice can contain business logic, right? Indeed. So don't, don't assume that a microservice is only this thing that knows how to talk to a database and return data from that. You might have microservices that kind of fit that stereotype of the DAO that we used to talk about in the monolith world. You may have other microservices that implement some bit of business logic and have to talk to DAOs to go grab information and process it. You may have a microservice that's a pricing engine. You may have a microservice that is going out and getting customer data and their invoices and munging those together and doing stuff with them. So in that case, you might have customers as a microservice, invoices as a microservice, and then a business service that's calling both of those. That business service is still a microservice, right? Uh, so it's just kind of the terminology of how we're applying it, I think. Um, if you consider all those things services, then yeah, they can all, different services can call services. And how you break them down, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of strategies for how you divide these, these. It really comes down to your, your particular problem in your business, but for some general guidance on that, I do recommend uh, you pick up, and it's, it's an easy read. You could probably read it before you go to bed tonight. Uh, pick up Matt Stein's uh, Migrating to Cloud Native, or I can't remember what it's called, uh, Migrating to Something. It's about that thick. It's a micro book. Yeah, it's a micro book. Easy read, and that, it has some general guidance in there for that, you know, and some some of the thinking that goes into building these types of applications. Or you could ask him; he's right there. Yeah. He's just... Oh, he's going to go sign books. So, go check that out. That's not necessarily how you would break it down. That's, I mean, that's kind of, that, that, even in a monolith, you know, uh, UI or controller and 
uh, service in DAO. That was just a convenient paradigm to sort of start with, but it's not even necessarily how applications ended up being broken down. That was just a convenient way to go to kind of start with. But a lot of times, services themselves may in turn call out to other services, if you want to call them that, even within a monolith. Um, because the service just got too busy. It had too many things going on inside of it. It made sense to break it into something in, into multiple pieces. So um, even on a monolith, that's not necessarily where you end up at. That's just maybe a good kind of starting point. When it comes to dealing with microservices, you might, you might think that way. You might continue, you might start that way. But the reality is you come down to dividing your services into, uh, well, first off, what makes sense for your application, but generally you think about it in terms of um, kind of different, different, the way I think about it, different views of the application. So if you're building an e-commerce application, you have customers. That's one thing to look at. You have orders, you have products. Even with a product, you might have reviews for the product, details for the product, inventory levels for the product, and those are three different ways of looking at a product. That would be multiple services, because your inventory system is completely independent of reviews that happen to be written about that product. So they don't need to be in the same service. They, they don't belong in the same service, so you would break those apart. Okay, I think that's about time. I think that's it? about it. So we'll hang around up here for a minute. Well, yeah, we'll be here for a bit. Otherwise, thank you very much. Have a great rest of the conference if we don't see you again.